There we go. All right. Welcome to Story Comic Presents, where we interview amazing storytellers and artists. This is episode 49. With us is Jay Moores, the acclaimed writer and illustrator of the Eden Park Tales universe. And I got to say, Jay, um, you know, we've, uh, we, we, uh, I met you a couple of years ago uh, at the, at the, one of the Vermont comic conventions. Yep. And, uh, and that's where I got my copy of the book. And, uh, and I got to say, you know, after reading it, it was, I, I have so many questions for you. And I know that uh, we'll, we'll do a deep dive and we'll talk a bit about the book and we'll talk about your art. We'll talk about all that uh, and um, all aspects of how you put the book together. Uh, and, um, and before we, before we get started talking about the, the hows and the whys, uh, do you want to first kind of give a brief uh, um, introduction uh, to the, to some of our listeners and viewers out there that uh, might not be familiar with uh, Eden Park Tales and Autumn Gray and and uh, your other work. Sure. Well, I'm Jay Moore's, not Jay Moore. <laughs> I know it's a little tricky to pronounce in Smith. <laughs> complicated last name. <laughs> um, but I'm a uh, writer, artist. I do children's books, uh, novel covers. I do work for different comic industries, uh, but Eden Park Tales is my personal uh, publishing house, basically, and Autumn Gray is my maiden comic book. I also have a couple children's novels through Eden Park Tales, and I have other spinoffs going on the going in the works and some other comics. But Autumn Gray is where I basically started in comics, and it's kind of my my biggest beast right now. And you mentioned I was listening to some of your previous interviews, and you said that initially Autumn Gray came out as it was a gonna you're gonna write it as a novel. Yep. And and you were mentioning this like okay, I'm writing this out, and then and then I'm I'm you know, and I have all these ideas. I'm trying to put together, and I kind of forget where I'm going in what direction. And then you kind of had an idea, and I remember you saying in a previous interview, you know, all your ideas are happening when you're driving. You know, you're thinking about this, thinking about that, and then you decided to make it a comic book yes so talk to talk to us about um the the how and the why of that decision from making right from a novelization of your story into a comic book version of your story okay well my first uh solo project was a uh children's book it's a full novel called illweed um and it was jam-packed with pictures i'd say it's about it was probably about 35% pictures, 65% text, um, 200 pages. So it was, yeah, he's got it right there on the screen. Look at that. Woo. There it is. Oh, it's over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was my first solo project and under the Eden Park Tales name. Um, shortly after that, I started to work on Autumn Gray, which was a much larger story. Um, I spent, oh, probably about four or five months writing it and thinking about it. Probably got a couple hundred pages under my belt before I started realizing I lost track of what I thought about writing versus what I had actually written. Because, as you said, I spent a lot of time writing in my head while driving. Um, so I'm sitting there looking at my mountain of text and thinking oh man i gotta sit here and read through the whole thing and sift through it it was kind of a daunting thought and, and then i'm like oh, and i still have to make pictures for it because i i'm i'm an illustrator by trade so i was like oh, i gotta make sure i put lots of pictures and then i was like you know what maybe i should break it down into shorter chunks and then i was like you know what <laughs> i'm gonna make myself a comic book <laughs> and i basically did and Honestly, bef before starting this comic, I mean, I, I know what comics are. I've read a couple, but I was not a comic collector. I didn't. Most of my comic influences were things like Garfield, Far Side, Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, still, some of my favorites. Uh, <laughs> but that's that's where my comic background came from originally. Oddly enough, and yep, go ahead. I was gonna say, um, and. The, I wanted I want you to also you know talk to us about is that when I, reading uh, after I finished reading Autumn Gray I posted a picture of it on my Instagram and I said this book 
and everybody and every, every like you know all the other interviews say it's kind of like this or it's kind of like you know everybody kind of has some version to compare it to to say hey did you and uh, what you know whatever whatever the comparison to it is is that it's give people a little bit of background on on well the the, the concept the concept of this the concept of the story you have is really fun and really unique with these these fairy creatures kind of you know living in you know, living in this part of Eden Park, Eden Park, uh, uh, New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, and I, and I don't want to give too much away based off of, off of that, but do you want to give people kind of like a synopsis of like the back of the book, you know, the you know, sure. the back of the box description of it? So the basic premise is that there are fairies and monsters, dragons, these things all do exist. Uh, they're just not allowed to be here anymore. Um, they basically have been banished from coexisting with us by their own kind. But there are pockets, like little hidden communities of them throughout the world. And one is in Eden Park, New Hampshire. Uh, it's basically up in the mountains of New Hampshire. And they kind of live, coexist with the local town, um, without too much too many spoilers like there's a homeless man who lives under a bridge who's actually a troll um some people have friends that are other people consider their imaginary friends which are actual things uh so this kind of this symbiotic relationship between people and fairies where people have no idea that it's actually fairies they're dealing with and essentially what happens is the, an enforcer from the fairy world is sent to punish the fairies for breaking the rules. And that's when people get involved and everything kind of flips upside down. Um, the main character, uh, her name is Kara Gray, she becomes Autumn Gray, is essentially, unbeknownst to her, her best friend growing up, her imaginary friend, is kind of one of the head honchos of the secret group of fairies there. And she's used as a weapon against her. And I think I didn't spoil very much there. No, and that's pretty much, yeah, that's, uh, that you're talking about maybe like the first five issues of, of it, you know, more or less right there. And so how, so when you put this together, so I want to, to put on your writer's hat for a second. Uh, how did you... <laughs> Um, what was your inspiration to come up with this? You mentioned before we we went on the air that you you kind you were you spent your summers you spent a lot of time up in northern New Hampshire, right? Uh, and how what was the, the you know that was maybe the inspiration, but how did the concept of um, putting together the the setting of the story started for you? Well, I I mean I always love the woods, the mountains, the lakes. Like that that's kind of my comfort place um so i took that kind of a setting and then i wanted to be i wanted the story to be modern i didn't want to slip back into like a standard fantasy story i wanted it to be more urban but i didn't want to get to the point where everyone has a cell phone everybody can track everything so it kind it's kind of set around my childhood you know early 90s mm -hmm. um so it's you know when you walked out the door you were basically unreachable until you walked back in that door, um, which adds a little more, you know, mystery when you're wandering through the woods and you can't just grab your phone and be like, hey, I just saw this. See, look at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it just seemed like an appropriate place in time um, for a place where things like fairies and monsters could hide. Right. So, so the idea of like wanting to kind of tell that story, but then what did you do from, um, from the world buildings perspective? Um, how did you come up with the, the idea of like the backstory and that there, there are some of these, you know, kind of fairies like, um, you know, in hiding or just kind of breaking the rules and, and then how did that build up into like your, you know, your, your larger meta plot? How did that work? Well, Without spoiling things, I started with the grand scheme, like the whole existence of 
the fairy world and back when it was intermingled with the human world and the reasons why, and I won't get into all of it because it does spoil an awful lot. Um, the reasons why they shut the door, banished their own kind from being here. I probably wouldn't reapproach it this way now that I'm much more savvy in comics, but I, I, I built a, it's a slow build as, as you, as you've read reading uh, issues one through five, like it starts out like, okay, this is like a regular town, regular park. And then occasionally, and then you see like, Ooh, that was a little weird. What was that? But it, it, it's a slow build. It's a slow transition from the world that we know into this other world that's right there, you know? Uh, you mentioned in, in a previous interview that you you decided to, you know, you got that comic book bug when you went to the, a, a free comic book day and, you know, and all your, your, your issue ones just kind of went out the door and you're like, wow, this, I might have something here. Yes. And talk to us about, and, and you also just did an Indiegogo campaign this past spring for issue number eight. Uh, and, and how would how would you just how would you describe as well of just is um, the the role you play as as a writer and an artist, but also you know as we talk about like in 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 the in the independent comic world, you have to wear many hats. One of them also being, um, you know, one of them also being you know kind of a uh, uh, you know being a marketing type to that. Yeah, um, you have a lot of full time jobs when you're you're. <laughs> You're your whole comic book company, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so I guess my question, my guess, my question for you is, um, what part of the jobs that that you've done as being an independent comic creator that you feel more comfortable doing, and what are the things that you really had to dig in to just kind of start teaching yourself? Well, what I find most comfortable is writing the stories. Um, I obviously I'm an image oriented person. And I'm also, actually, I probably should have gone into film because I picture most of my images in movement. Um, so when I'm writing a story, I can already see what I what you know what the scene looks like. Hmm. So it, it became it becomes very natural for me to I kind of draw, when I when I work on a comic, I kind of draw it and write it at the same time. I have a, a basic outline of what I want to do for a, for an issue. Um, and, and like, all right, this needs to happen. That needs to happen. Let's see how we get there. And I, it's very organic when you're both the writer and the artist, you don't have to write a script and then hand it to the next person who then creates the images to go with that script. It, you do it all at once, you know? Hmm. Um, so like when I started, it, obviously it was my first comic, um, and at this point, with number eight, I've probably got about 25, 30 comics under my belt. <laughs> so there's, there's a vast difference in my experience personally as a comic book artist from issue one to issue eight. Right. Um, and so how do you – so right now as, as, you're, as you're working on your – you know, working on um, issue eight, and now you're – I'm, I'm presuming like you're, going, you're on issue nine now as well as you're getting that done? Yes. Yeah. And – do you see do you see yourself um you know with that uh with, with that um that that evolution of of as the story's going has there been any as as that writer and that creator how much has that story changed for you since issue one how much is because you, you you mentioned too that there's going to be four parts you got autumn gray then you're going to have winter frost is that what you yes yep yeah i'm going to yeah. do each season it's going to be 10 issues to each season um there's a like each season is its own story, but there's this overarching like thing that's going to be happening throughout all four, and it builds up to a climax in the final season. Um, but the I lost track of the question. <laughs> so I, my my question to my my question is that how much have you been able to how now that you're on issue A and you know there's potentially going to have like basically. 40 issues of this now on issue eight working on issue nine how much of the story changed since you then your first imagining of the entire plot now that you're on so, issue issue nine so the fun thing is i have actually saved 
what I've written for the novel. <laughs> um, when I first started issue one, I literally took chapters of the novel and like converted them into a visual medium. Mm. So for the first issue, I did that. The second issue, I started, you know, changing a little bit. At this point, um, I feel like the story's kind of grown in its own direction. Mm. If I went back and looked at where I'd be in the novel right now versus the comic, they'd be almost completely different. Wow. Okay. Is there any specific, is it, has there been any specific characters that you've seen some of your readers and fans kind of like gravitate towards that you feel kind of naturally inclined to yeah. add more into? And who yeah, when I get feedback from people about certain characters, um, it just, you know, like, well, okay, if people really connect to this character, again, I need to make sure this character's role, you know, is more significant or, or, well, this character is kind of a dud, but I, I got to keep them in my back pocket because I have plans for them later. But I'll, you know, you, you, you have to adjust. Mm. And obviously converting from a novel to a comic is you, you have to tell the story in a different way. Right. Well, give me an give give us an example. Are there any specific without giving away any? Is there any any specific characters that you you didn't think was going to resonate so much or wasn't that important? That was more of a tertiary character that now you see is um, based off of reader feedback that you you're doing a more of a deep dive with. Okay, um, one of those would be uh, Nikolai, which if you've read issues one through five, you know who he is. Um, he's kind of a essentially a gypsy uh he sells fake heal alls remedies until he gets chased out of town he goes to another town and does the same thing um i figured uh he he shows up in one scene and he was going to kind of fade away after a little bit but he's i've gotten a lot of feedback from people they love his character they love his personality so he's um he's gotten a little more significant and i'm actually working on a separate project, which is a spinoff specifically of him, oh, but wow. it, it follows stories about him much later than Autumn than the Autumn Gray series. Okay. So I guess the one spoiler there would be that he actually survives. <laughs> <laughs> and it's and it has been any of the characters are, are kind of inspirations of people you know in real life, whether they be the fairy characters or like the human characters. Um I mean, you can't help it when you're right. when you're writing. You 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 obviously connect your your characters with people you know, or people you used to know, or people you'd like to know. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's it's funny. Like especially since I do all parts of it, I feel like this comic is kind of it's a little bit of a, a self portrait as a comic book artist for me. Mm. Um, like when I go through good periods i feel like parts of the story are more upbeat and then darker periods when you know it's just it's just the way it happens when you're an artist right you know and you did and you and yeah what brings me up to that point is that you mentioned in a um uh an earlier interview that um a lot of artists and a lot of writers are um it's kind of like feast or famine for a lot of artists and writers this year with with uh with covid-19 um and you're one of the you're one of the um, uh, one of the, the the prior folks that you mentioned that you've been working so much. You've oh produced goodness. so much this year. Well, what happened was uh, with the the initial shutdown in uh, March, um, I ended up having six weeks at home, and I used those six weeks. I I got up at you know four four thirty in the morning, and I got right to the drawing board. I was determined to get Autumn Gray number eight complete. I'm like, I have the time. I got to do this. Um, I got that done. And then I did a children's book the following. Like, I, I, got, I was already halfway through Autumn Gray. So I was able to finish it in just over a week, um, which is tough because it's actually a 36 page comic. So wow. it's, it's a little longer than a, your traditional comic. Um, but it, the original issues are in black and white. So. I don't have the whole coloring process to slow me down either. Um, but I managed to get that done in week one. Week two, I did a children's book on COVID, which has been booming lately. Um, I have school systems that are raising money to print books 
to give to the children at different communities and stuff. So that's what I did week two. Week three, I reached out to a publishing house that I do work for, um, picked up a bunch more work. It, it just like those six weeks, it was just like project, 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 project. And then I went back to my day job. Um, but suddenly I had enough work from all these different places that I had, you know, I had turned a 20 hour week of art into 40 to 50 hours a week of art on top of a full-time job. Wow. That's amazing. Um, and, and I want to, I want to ask you these questions because uh, your, your, your artwork and your style of your illustrations is, um, is, is, is fascinating. And I'm just going to pull it up for people to kind of see for our, for our viewers to kind of get a look at, uh, what your artwork kind of looks like now talk to us about your process now you mentioned but you mentioned earlier you mentioned um uh, you mentioned before that you know originally it was it was correct me if i'm wrong but i know like the original trade the original issues were black and white yes and then for the color trade the, then you made it color for the for the trade. colored it for the trade book yes um, um so when i started uh issue one i i was traveling a lot um i didn't really have a, a studio set up so i was drawing separate panels completely separately in sketchbooks okay and then i would scan them all onto my computer and assemble them that's how i that's how i started anyway um but over a little bit of time i realized i have so much more control over the, the flow of the pages if i can if i have the space to you know draw an entire page as opposed to a bunch of little snapshots and trying to assemble them on the computer um so my process is basically i, I sit down I, I i have a a list i started with a list of 10 issues i had my my main story the things i needed to happen as like bullet points mm -hmm. then i take that and broke it down into all right how many issues do i want to tell this in i figured 10 issues um, so I took those bullet points and broke them up, made sure, you know, the story continues in each issue. Uh, then I continue to break it down from there until I had basically, I mean, I can show you a little peek at some of that. Um, I basically end up with a list and I don't have my notebook here. Uh, but I'm, I have a list, like, I'll have a list 1 through 36 for a comic issue, 36 pages. And I'll have just a brief sentence, like, you know, Kara and Mel meet. Uh, then the next, then it'll be a number two, and it's like, Kara and Mel sneak off into the woods. And then So that's kind of how I break down the general pages. Things sometimes shift when I'm actually doing the artwork, like, I, I find more on a certain page so it goes over into the next page but i try to hold to that course so that i accomplish what i need to accomplish in my 36 pages um so i break it down that way so i basically at that point i have one sentence for each page and i've already figured out in my head what i want to happen so then i take those sentences i take a sketchbook and i write each sentence at the top of each page for 36 pages with the number and then I start just doodling stick figures, doing the things they're supposed to do on pages, kind of like like this kind of thing. This is. Oh, wow. So, I mean, this one I didn't necessarily write right out of the line, but I just have the number okay. of the page. And then then I just kind of just enough so I can follow it because I'm the artist and the writer. So I don't have to draw something for someone else to understand. Right. But I just like work on the characters and the movement and like, all right, so like here I want this character to swoop around and then, then it's, this is very confusing because when you look at the screen, it's not a mirror image. So when I move to the left, my hand moves to the right. <laughs> uh, but basically like you can see how this character, how I have the movement here with this character spinning around with its mouth open and then it's diving at the person. And then they, those two circles are where they lock onto each other. And then the bottom corner there, they're basically swirling around together. Right. And so I kind of work out my motion like that. So that image I just showed you, I can actually show you what it turns into, which is because I have the actual comic that that's from right here in my hand. So that would be this right here. Oh, wow. 
See, there's the creature turning around with its mouth open, coming at her. Mm -hmm. Coming in, they lock together, and then in the bottom, they swirl down into the, the depths of the water. Mm -hmm. And so you, okay, it's, and so how do you then go from the sketch to when you sketch it out? Do you do all that digitally, or that's a, on a actual sketchbook, or like a or like uh, a, a Bristol board bat or pad, or how do yeah, you? It's, it's I, I'll take I'll take my sketch and I'll sit down with a full eleven by seventeen piece of Bristol board and I will draw draw it out, um, and then I'll I'll ink right directly on that. Okay, wow. Then I hand draw the page. Okay. Is that is that pencil or what is that? Is that's all it's actually all... ballpoint pen? Really? I I pencil it lightly, and then I'll go over it in ballpoint pen. Okay. Um, I actually decided ages ago. Uh, I my, I was the first person at my college that did his uh, senior project in ballpoint pen <laughs> at an art college, and they're like, "Why?" And I said, "Because I spend more time in classes." drawing with my ballpoint pen in the margins of my notebook than using any other medium right so why not <laughs> so i i decided to go back to that idea with my comic so i this comic i actually draw in ballpoint pen uh then i scan it into the computer and add my gray tones or my colors on the computer okay so you take so the, you know that like for for this is um you know looking at this from one of your autumn gray issues so yes. initially in the uh when it was a an issue this was in black and white it was a black and yes. white picture and so that, then actually looking at it was from a free comic book day comic i actually made okay <laughs> and how, so how did you colorize it did you then scan it you put scan it in did you use photoshop or clip studio paint what did you how did you go from there i use photoshop um I, i'll do like a it's gotten more complicated because i've grown as an artist um i i wasn't too savvy with digital orig originally um i'm kind of old school you know drawing things by hand coloring them with watercolors and things like that but I, I've stepped into the digital age a little better. Um, but yeah, I used Photoshop to, I used Photoshop for the gray tones. And then when I colored this, I didn't want to lose the, um, the black and white feel of it. So it, as you can probably tell reading through the, through the book, I keep the, all the colors kind of muted. Hmm. So that it still has the same feeling it had as a gray, as a gray tone. All right. So, do you consider yourself then a writer who draws or do you consider yourself an artist who writes? I consider myself a storyteller. <laughs> and, and I don't and, use any means necessary, whether it's theater, whether it's books, whether it's writing. It's, I just I just love to come up with stories and tell them in any medium that's going to get people's attention. Right. But then I guess my question is, is that it's like, as you say it, there's only so many hours in the day. Has there ever been a point where you've actually looked at this and say, I need to tell this story. It's 40 issues. I'm gotten eight done. I'm probably going to get, you know, you know, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll finish autumn gray probably next year or, or however you know, yep, I'm hoping. fingers crossed. <laughs> is there a point we can say that this is so important that I, I, that I would, that you would like farm out either the art or the script like you'd get, is there any part of it that you would feel comfortable to say, all right, I need to now in order to expedite this, I, I'd be willing to give up one part of uh, that. When, what, so, what part would that be? The spinoff that I'm, I mentioned earlier with the character Nikolai from autumn gray is actually the first comic where I'm writing it and I've hired an artist to draw it. Hmm. It's 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 just simply the art the art part of a comic. The amount of time it takes me to write an issue of a comic equals the amount of time it takes me to do the art for one page of that comic. Yeah. So, and, and nothing against the writers. I mean, coming up with the concepts is is definitely tough. Um, but time wise, I find that doing the art takes a lot more time. Right. Um, so I've started looking at. I have a 
I don't know. I've got a whole bookshelf full of stories I want to get out there. Um, and I know that I don't have the personally, I don't have enough time to tackle them all. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to, you know, bring in other artists. Um, right now that particular piece is being submitted to a couple different publishing houses. We're going to see if we can get someone else to be the marketer because that's probably my least favorite part of the indie comic thing. Mm -hmm. Um, my Indiegogo went well, but I've had some devastating Kickstarters in the past, and I, 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 I hate doing it. <laughs> I really do. It's, it's, it's. I feel like I don't know. It, it, it's just not my style. I, 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 if someone else wants to promote promote it and sell it and, and get ten percent or whatever, great. Have fun. <laughs> And would you and the the artists that you're reaching out to for the for the Nikolai story is it are you kind of married to the idea that has to be in that that similar style as yours or are you no um and I, I I intentionally pick somebody because I think their style fits the story well um this particular artist he, the, we we have he's definitely gotten a little influence for this comic from reading Autumn Gray like he's it's, it's a little looser than some other things he's done, but it's definitely his art style. It's kind of weird because it's the first time I kind of see, I see my story in there in my style kind of mixed with someone else's style. You know what I mean? Hmm. It's kind of a hybrid. Yeah. And, and so, and so, and do you have, uh, you know, with that, with with the autumn gray, I just love the, the you know the world building pieces to to the to when you you know put it together. What are um, what were some, what were some of the aspects of it? Like, for instance, is there a um, uh, you know looking at autumn gray or looking at Eden Park Tales as kind of like an, an IP? Um, is there any other aspects you'd like to kind of see it after? Um, you know, all four volumes are finished. Is there any other types of mediums you like to see it in since you, you write in so many different ways as well? Oh, of course. I think if you ask just about any, any person working on a comic anywhere, they fantasize it being a TV show or a movie or, 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 you know, being, being in a, a medium. I mean, comics are great, but you're not going to get as many people to read a comic as you're going to get to watch something on Netflix or, or in a movie theater, it's just it's just the way of the world, you know. It, you always want to get it into a bigger market, right? And so now, uh, so so uh, what else do you have? Uh, you know, working in pipes. You just finished up. Also, a um, you're working on a was it a, was it a Kickstarter with um, with Jack Holder? With Jack Holder. Yep, I had that one. Um, I, I have a bunch of projects in the works. I have that anthology with Jack Holder called Commandment, which the Kickstarter just ended a couple weeks back. It was successful, so yay! Um, I have... I, I'm always doing work for Dynamite Entertainment. Um, I've been doing some stuff on Vampirella uh, lately, and um, uh, I, I did some stuff for Fallout recently. I've been working on other like collector card sets with a couple different companies lately. Those are great because a lot of times I'm doing sketch cards for them and, and it's like a great warm up. You're drawing a little three and a half by two and a half picture right on a card. I can actually, why not? These ones have already been out so I can actually show you one. Like this is, Oh, cool. Um, this is a hand drawn card I did from uh, the chaos. It's a comic series called chaos uh, through diamond entertainment. This, this is a hand-drawn sketch card that I just did for them. Okay. And do you, do you get mostly because with now that you're saying you're getting a lot of more a lot uh, you know you're getting other jobs and stuff. Is it mostly you see people coming in asking you for um, more of the illustrating side of it or from the more the writing side of it? Uh, it's more the art. Um, I think as far as writing goes. Usually the writers go out there looking for artists for for their projects more often than the other way around. Um, I've, I mean, if people want me to write something, they could definitely ask. I, I'm I'm happy to, but yeah, it's 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 almost almost exclusively art. Hmm. 
the writing is basically my own stuff. Right. And, and how would you, how would you describe also to the difference between um, the different types of uh, uh, the different types of styles as it comes to, as you say, like writing a comic book script as compared to a novel, as compared to putting, writing down oh. things in a play. You, you have to bear it, it you have to bear in mind how it's perceived. Hmm. Um, obviously, in a novel, there aren't images unless you fill it with pictures, like I like to do. But, <laughs> but in general, you have to explain anything you want people to be able to see. Um, in a comic, it's you, you. You let the pictures do a lot of the storytelling for you, so you don't explain everything the same way. The same thing when you're writing for uh, for theater or movies or what have you. Um, again, the visuals are going to take a lot of those words away. Um, I've actually worked with a couple people on scripts, and I've tried to explain to them that you don't need to have this whole description. Like, this guy doesn't have to tell you everything that he's doing because the picture is going to show that he, he's doing it, you know? You can... You can cut back like I've had some comics that have so many words in them. They're basically like a couple floating heads and all text. It's just like we got to get rid of some of this. People, people want to read a novel to go pick up a novel. <laughs> so how do you? What do you do then when you uh, when when you draft out some of that? Do you have you know somebody like a beta reader, somebody who goes over the script, uh, the script of the of um, Autumn Gray first, or do you or do you put it out and say hey? What's your feedback on it? How does that work? That you, uh, when you kind of do that first exposure to to folks, well, what what aspects of the of the process do you first get feedback with? Well, when I first started, uh, back when I wrote Illweed and I did my first comic, um, I had a business partner. Um, we ended up going separate ways because we both had different visions for what we wanted to do. She's doing great. She's been successful with her own projects, and I've been successful with mine. Um, and you know, we're not there's no ill will there or anything um but we just both had different visions for where we wanted to go with with our comics and our styles and everything uh but at the beginning we would meet once a week and we would be basically that would we'd assign projects to ourselves um like like i'd be like all right i need to have pages one through five inked for our next meeting so it created accountability because one of the hardest things when you're working on your own project is actually getting it done because there's no deadline. There's nobody waiting for it really. Hmm. Um, so when we started, it was a big help for both of us that we would basically uh, uh, give ourselves projects. And then when we met next week, we had to have our homework done, you know? <laughs> and, and did uh, you, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, and once we went our separate ways, um, when I work on a comic, I do have a couple of friends that, you know, are eager for the next one. So I might pick somebody or a couple people and give them the preliminary just to kind of go over and let me know what they think of it. Mm. And, and so, so with that said, had there, have there been like feedback to say, you know, what's happening here? And is there any feedback that you've gotten from, from that is, uh, um, you know, through, through autumn gray of of um anything that they they recommended that you've seen that um from your first draft that you've seen that to cut out completely because it was it didn't fit at that time or it was or any parts of they they you've seen people to kind of say you know more detail here how how much how much of the feedback that you see is um has has changed um some parts of the aspect of your story um yeah feedback is always great um it it always helps when people read a story and and like for instance in this one um, i in issues one through five people are wondering why the main character would be with her boyfriend mm. because they're both pretty terrible to each other <laughs> um you know what i'm talking about <laughs> Yep. Um, so I made a point actually in issue eight to do a flashback that it kind of explained why at the time it was convenient and 
reasonable for the two of them to start dating. Uh, so that was definitely direct, direct uh, had to do directly with uh, the feedback I'd gotten from some people about the particular characters and something that, you know, when I'm working on something, I'm seeing it from a very different angle than somebody who's reading it. Um, so a lot of times it's, it's extremely helpful for somebody to give me the viewpoint of the person reading it as opposed to me writing it. Mm. And, and so I have, so, and, and, and now that you've seen, and, and right now, like for instance, for the issue seven and issue eight and, 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 and and further on um that that process um and and at what point well, i guess my question is for you is also is like at um talk to us a bit about that process of of even from that perspective of because you you said earlier too you know you got a full-time job as well and this is also your other full-time job of produce of of working on this how how specific do you have to be from a inspiration perspective or like a, or a scheduling perspective that you allocate, do you allocate time to get this done? Or do you just, are you one of those artists or writers that just always has a notebook in your pocket or how does that work for you as you make, as you produce your, um, your works? Well, I always keep either a notebook or a sketchbook with me wherever I go. Um, and I wish I had more opportunities to take it out and throw stuff in it when things occur to me. Uh, but a lot of times I don't. Um, it's it's tough. Um, like I, I I would love I I'd love to be able to just pop out an issue every month. Mm. You know, it, it the problem is you know self self published comics are fun. It's actually the happy if I'm going to sell anything to somebody, I feel so much more pride in them buying a comic versus buying a print or something at a, at a comic con, which hopefully we will have a couple of those next year. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I would love to write it faster. I would love to not have a million other things I had to do all the time. Mm. Like ideally I would love, I was originally hoping I'd get issue nine out before Christmas and, I haven't inked the first page of issue nine. So <laughs> is there, has, has there been any, um, as you said, like any, uh, has there been any updates as, as you, as you kind of showed us earlier about how you sketch things out Go from, you know, from that example of issue one, all the way to issue eight, is there any streamlining in the process that you've, you've done that you've seen kind of the help that, that, that has kind of enhanced um, your time and also the, uh, the the pages itself as well. Yeah, it's kind of a double edged sword because there are things that used to take me a lot longer, like coloring and you doing the gray tones on a page, mm. which at this point I have a pretty good quick system I can and it's even more dynamic than it used to be. But the the the, the bad part of it is I am also much more detail oriented than I was when I first started. So pages in general take me a lot longer to draw. Um, like if you look back at the, the early issues, a lot of the, the backgrounds and things are much simpler than, than they've become. It's, mm -hmm. it's just part of the, part of the beast, I suppose. <laughs> right. And when you have the finished product of the finished issue, where do you go to get it produced? Cause I see you also have your things available on Comixology. You also have, have uh, Lulu available, but where do you get the actual like floppies produced? Um, Actually, I've used a couple different printer printing houses for it, um, but I actually found one up in Saratoga, like a mom and pop printer house. Oh, cool! That makes them for me. Um, one of the convenient things is the Comic Con that I I usually go to up there is twice a year, so I will set up my printing orders so then I can pick them up when I go up there for those Comic Cons. Um, so it saves me on shipping. Right. And it also, it's, you know, supporting local businesses, which is, yeah, yeah. And too. they've been great. Cause there was a time when they misprinted, it was a color comic, not autumn gray. It was another one and they printed it in black and white. And I showed up for the comic con and, and 
and you know picked up the box and then went to the show and opened it up and i'm like oh no so i called them up in like three hours they came to the comic-con with a box in color oh, nice. for me so I, I i love those guys it's called camelot printing okay up in saratoga new york um they don't do many comics and I think they're kind of hoping I move on and find somewhere else, but they've been so good to me. I keep going back to them because they, <laughs> they don't do that. Like they have to special specialty cut the pages, you know. Yeah. Um, but when I don't use them, I usually use um, a Comic Wellspring, yeah. which is a print on. You, you can do like a minimum of twenty five comics, so you can make as many as you want. Um, but I go to Comic Wellspring for my trade books because. That's definitely something that Camelot Printing doesn't actually do. Um, they're they're very good. The prices are, are definitely reasonable. Um, obviously, the more the more I can print in one whack, the cheaper they are per book. Hmm. Um, and and I see too that you're on Comicsology, which is so fun yeah. because not a lot of people go on Comicsology. How have what have you have you seen uh, any upticks or how does um, that? I, I every once in a while I get a little check in the mail. I'm like, "Woo, look, Comicsology got me a check." <laughs> you know, every once in a while, like there's sales on there. Um, it's a huge market. Uh, you can go on Comicsology and find just about anything. Um, what what I usually do is when I complete my comic, I send it to the publisher. It's, it's kind of part of my routine. I'm like, "Got it done, yay! All right." So I send it to my publisher. I'm uh, a publisher. My publishing house. I send. It over to Comicsology because I have an account like from through through Eden Park Tales to Comicsology and um, and I send it right out to I have a couple people that kind of proofread it even though at that point I've sent it to print so it's kind of done <laughs> <laughs> but I send it to all all those places like in the same day it's like my my routine like I got this done off to there 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 and there okay whew, done. Would you advise uh, any other independent comic creators to utilize uh, uh, the a digital format like that, like Comixology? Yes, because it's free. Mm. If, if you are making your own comic, you are, you know, and you you want to get it out there, digital is free. Um, if I could go back in time and start over, I may have set up a web page. It may be released one page a week just to read for free on there to build up a fan base. So then when I actually printed a comic, I'd have a, a fan base right there to, to buy the first issues. Um, I, I and, and obviously, Comixology does not charge you to put things on it. You have to be patient, though. When you send them there, you have to wait quite a while for them to get it onto, onto the platform. Mm. But again, it's free, right? And so, so this has been. We're already at an hour. That was quick. <laughs> so, um, so Jay, where can people where can people find you if they want to learn more about um, Autumn Gray and the rest of your Eden Bark tales? Well, thanks to this lovely uh, app that we're using right here, down at the bottom of my name, <laughs> is is right over here. Look, I, I'm getting better at <laughs> of the screen. <laughs> Um, that there is my publishing website, EdenParkTales.com. I do not update it as often as I should. Um, but you can, uh, there is a store there. You can buy artwork. You can buy issues of Autumn Gray. Another great way and probably a far more frequent way people do it is to find me on social media. Um, you can find me on Facebook. It's Jay Moores as it's right there. You just type right over there. <laughs> I type that in on, on, on Facebook and I'll pop up. You can be my friend. You can follow me, whatever. Um, come on in. I also have an Eden Park Tales page on there and an Autumn Gray page on there. So you can definitely um, find me or one of my things on there pretty easily. And I update that pretty frequently. And I'm always throwing new artwork on there and talking about podcasts I'm on, like this lovely one. Um, so... You know, I, I highly recommend checking it out on there. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks a lot, Jay. And I'm excited to I'm I'm excited to uh, you know look forward to reading more Autumn Gray. Um, and and I say you're you're there's you're 
there's stuff going on. There's there's Jay Moore stuff happening all over the place. As you said, you got all kinds of art and all kinds of things that uh, people can find you at. So yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sprouting up all over the place like a weed. <laughs> <laughs> so so thank you, and uh, come back again when uh, you uh, when you're needing to promote you know, issue nine and ten, and when the next trade comes out and winter frost and uh, and yeah. uh, summer green and. Uh, uh, well, the spring green and summer and blue. I just made those up. I don't even know those are the titles. But I'm just saying. <laughs> Would it be freaky if I told you that those were the titles? <laughs> They're not. But it would be freaky. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Jay. Thank you very much, Barney. Then I, I scan that in. I can actually show you one of those too. I just give me one second. I have to go in and record here. Oh, cool. Studio or something. We're getting that. Uh, we're getting the, uh, the so deep behind. dive. The deep dive on this, Jay. This is what I wanted. That's what I was hoping to see. Yeah. Oh, I even found the page. <laughs> Let's stick with the same page. How's that? Nice. So.